Now, the worst part, or what I consider to be the worst part about this series, is twofold, and I have to reiterate them for anybody that hasn't watched this show but is considering it. First, the show's intro episodes, like the first three or four, are horrible, and I'm quite sure a lot of people will agree with me on that. Those first few episodes don't really give you a sense of what this show is actually about. Now, I'm not here to pick on Arcata specifically. This is an opinion that I've heard quite often, even from fans of the 2011 anime. But it's one that I simply can't agree with. I think the first half of that statement is completely false, though I can somewhat understand the second half. The initial premise of Hunter x Hunter isn't all that interesting or inventive at face value. Gon wants to find his father, he is often described as being just like his father, and our three relevant characters want to be hunters. What exactly is a hunter? We don't know, and we won't get many clear examples of what being a hunter entails until several episodes later. If there's anything that I've learned during my time as an anime fan, though, it's that a show shouldn't be defined by its premise. One of the complaints I've heard lobbed at the early material is that it's too childish, that it adheres too closely to average shonen tropes. And I can't really argue against that. Yes, a manga that was published in Weekly Shonen Jump tried to appeal to a demographic similar to that of its contemporaries. Of course it's going to use techniques that fans of the genre enjoy. Maybe you're just not a fan of that genre, and that's perfectly fine. But criticizing those early episodes for being too shonen would be like criticizing Koei no Katachi, a film that tackles topics like self-hatred and suicide, for being too dramatic. Among the most notable aspects of Hunter x Hunter is its gradual dark tone shift, and these early episodes play a tremendous role in making that transition as effective as it is. The importance of establishing this lighthearted and perhaps even unimpressive atmosphere cannot be understated. You think that this is just another laid-back action-adventure romp, and unless you're paying close attention to the details, the first arc lulls you into a false sense of security that persists until, before you know it, people are dropping like flies. Even something as minor as Gon's exaggerated pinky promise with Mito serves as a heartbreaking juxtaposition to the monster of murderous intent we see later on. This is one aspect that the 1999 anime fails to capitalize on. Instead of going for the same fake-out, the 99 adaption implements a darker take on the material from the outset. And while I think that's one of the strongest facets of that interpretation alongside its directing, I wouldn't ever recommend that anime as a starting point for new viewers. I'll save an in-depth side-by-side comparison for another time, but for the sake of this video, I prefer the 2011's version of these early events. Now, what some people may be trying to say with a statement like this is that the show isn't at its best when it's playing the shonen formula fairly straightforwardly. In other words, that the early material does little to showcase what makes Hunter x Hunter so special. Can I agree with this sentiment? Eh, to an extent. The Hunter exam is not the best arc in the series, not by a long shot, but I'd hardly call it a bad introduction. Truth be told, I think this part of the story outlines several of Hunter x Hunter's core strengths. Strong characterization, logical resolutions to intricate conflicts, Togashi's tendency to develop relatively unimportant characters, it's all there. So, from a technical standpoint at least, the first few episodes absolutely give you a sense of what this show is about. The first scene of Gon catching the fish hints at Gon's determination and stubbornness. He has been after it for a week straight, and his enthusiasm for the task shows just how eager he is to become a hunter. We don't know what that entails yet, but by juxtaposing Gon's childish cheeriness with Mito's somber, begrudging acceptance, the show hints that, while a child like Gon might revere the idea of becoming a hunter, there are some serious negative aspects to that title he will eventually encounter. I found myself getting immediately invested in Gon's character when his response to the idea that his father abandoned him to become a hunter was, isn't that amazing? Not only did this connect with me on a personal level, but it also sets up Gon's curiosity and open-mindedness towards others. The expected response in a scenario like this would be one of contempt or entitlement. My father should have been there for me. He should take responsibility for his child. Gon doesn't make statements like these. Instead of blaming his father, he becomes fascinated by the notion that being a hunter is more worthwhile than raising one's own child. Not only does Gon want to find his father, but he wants to understand him. He doesn't just want his father to explain himself, he wants to experience the supposed benefits of a hunter's life for himself and form his own conclusions from that knowledge. And that's part of what makes him such an interesting protagonist. He isn't out to change the way the world operates or settle some sort of grudge with his old man, he wants to learn. Skipping ahead to when the storm breaks out, Gon helps some sickly passengers while Leorio and Karapika ignore them. 
This is a strong way of fleshing out Gon's kindness before we figure out just how selective that kindness can be later on. And speaking of Leorio and Karapika, the body language alone in this scene gives you a decent idea of how each character operates. Gon bounces around, smiling and waving at the captain. Karapika stares straight ahead indifferently, keeping his arms at his sides as if guarding himself from a potential attack. And Leorio keeps his hands in his pockets and glares into the distance as if to say, quit wasting my time. Considering that he's the man who acts the most disrespectfully in this scene, it's ironic that he would be the one who demands it the most. This effectively establishes his role as the weakest of the four main characters, as his contradictory actions and goals make him the most hypocritical and therefore the least serious of the three in this scene. However, he is the first to reach out to Gon after the latter reveals his ambitions, which again foreshadows his role in the group. At this point, Karapika is the only character who hasn't addressed Gon, and that paints an accurate picture of their relationship later in the story. Leorio is the first person to reach out to the boys in York New, while Karapika had to be addressed by them. Leorio calls when Gon is in the hospital, while Karapika does nothing. I already touched on Karapika's excellent exposition in my thematic breakdown video, so I'll jump straight to Leorio. His dialogue is backed by a bombastic jovial track, and the visuals are portrayed in these cartoony, dreamlike fantasies, which complements the idea that we shouldn't take him seriously at this point. There's obviously more going on with him than what he lets on, and we'll later get proof of that in episode 4, when he delves into his true reasons for wanting money. The two get into a petty argument about respect, which prompts Leorio to challenge Karapika to a fight. Before their fight can actually begin, however, Katsuo, that beta male from earlier, is launched between them by the storm, and what happens next is another important moment in fleshing out both Karapika and Leorio. Unlike earlier, where the two showed no desire to assist a large group of helpless nobodies, both men immediately drop their grudge and attempt to save him. This shatters the potential facade that either character is fueled solely by self-interest, but when paired with the earlier scene, it also shows that they're not completely self-sacrificing either. There are two important details to consider with regards to these two scenes. The threat the victims are presented with, and the burden any assistance would cause for irrelevant characters. Katsuo probably would have died had he fallen off of the ship. While it seems unlikely that this lot was in any severe danger, going off of that, helping a group of people would require much more effort than helping a single person. In short, saving Katsuo was a more pressing matter and required relatively less effort from our protagonists. I bring this up because it adds some extra context behind certain actions these characters will take later on, like leaving an unconscious person in the middle of a forest. They aren't heartless or selfish, but there's definitely a level of self-interest involved that most cookie-cutter heroes don't have. Then there's the way that Leorio and Karapika jump outside of the ship to try to grab this guy. I can't think of a much better way to visually show someone going the extra mile to lend a hand. Having their conflict resolved this quickly without drawing a ton of attention to it also highlights just how stupid they were being in the first place. And Gon's actions emphasize his ability to read fake people and understand their true motives. He dives off the ship without even questioning whether or not Karapika and Leorio would catch him. He just knew that they would. Despite the fact that Gon only just met these two, he was already willing to trust them with his life. And that speaks volumes about this young boy. The way that the story presents obstacle after obstacle leading up to the Hunter exam continues to build hype for and stress the scale of this event. If simply getting to the site is a trial in its own right, one can only imagine what the exam itself has to offer. Furthermore, finding the truth through misdirection requires a considerable amount of analytical thinking on the part of our heroes, which is indicative of the way Hunter x Hunter consistently prioritizes mental prowess over brute force. These first few challenges aren't just useless filler, they are tools used to effectively establish a key mechanic of the story. Going off of that, these tasks also serve to strengthen what would otherwise be a fairly weak bond between Leorio, Karapika, and Gon. Consider what unfolds when the three get off the boat. Gon follows the captain's advice to head for the tree at the hilltop, while Leorio insists they take a bus that will supposedly transport them directly to the city where the exam is located. Gon brushes him off, and Karapika opts to follow, not due to the captain's advice, but because Gon's behavior interests him. Leorio leaves them behind, and it's only when he finds out that the bus is a trap that he promptly rejoins the other two. 
I like this moment for a number of reasons. The trio's disagreement and their subsequent actions highlight how this is merely a band of acquaintances at this point. Karapika may be intrigued enough to follow Gon, but Leorio isn't so quick to trust someone he just met. On one hand, Gon may be the boy who saved a man from certain death, but he's also the boy who dove headfirst off a boat during an intense storm. In this moment, Lario decides not to put his fate in Gon's reckless hands. And I think that's much more fascinating than the three pushing forward without conflict just for the sake of faster pacing or plot progression. Sure, they do wind up working together in the end, but at this stage, it's simply because they share a common goal. They don't immediately become friends upon meeting each other, but any issues between them are handled quietly enough that one could easily overlook them. This gives the characters time to develop a genuine emotional connection to one another, and it gives us time to get invested in their relationship without it feeling rushed or corny. When the three take the pop quiz, Karapika sees through the challenge, Leorio blows a gasket about how the question can't be answered, and Gon contemplates what the answer to this no-win question might be. For the sake of the test, the question is rhetorical, but of all people, it's the simple-minded Gon who perhaps displays the most forward thinking of the three. Given his behavior, it's uncertain whether he was fooled by the nature of the test or not, but this interaction does at least show some awareness on Gon's part. It's a small piece of characterization whose importance you might miss at first, but when you consider that Gon's future selfishness is based not in ignorance, but in a knowledgeable acceptance of the nature of his actions, this scene takes on a whole new significance. Then there's the Magical Beast test. What makes this specific bit so fascinating is that each individual succeeds for different reasons. Leorio efficiently treats the injured man, Karapika showcases his vast knowledge and deductive prowess, and Gon manages to distinguish the two Kirikos based on almost unnoticeable features. I really like how the anime runs with it and gives them slightly different designs and voices to match Gon's description. <laughs> It wasn't until I revisited the episode and paid close attention that I actually noticed it. There's also a small bit of characterization for Karapika when he smacks this imposter Leorio in the face. When asked how did he know that it was an imposter, Karapika replies that he didn't, saying that he only smacked him in the face for abandoning a defenseless man. It's a cool and funny fakeout that digs a bit deeper into his personality. Getting back to the test itself, while the first two stages of the pre-exam had a specific purpose behind it, this stage was far more open-ended. There was no set criteria for passing this test. So long as one was skilled at something, that's all that mattered. It adds an extra layer of nuance to the Hunter exam and the title of Hunter itself. Becoming a top hunter isn't about becoming the strongest or the smartest or the kindest. It could be any of those things, all of those things, or none of those things, depending on one's strengths and weaknesses. You can be dense and emotional, reckless and naive. So long as you're capable in some capacity, you can still qualify for the exam. On a darker note, though, that also hints at the notion that hunters can be deeply flawed people. And while that idea isn't really focused on here, it's details like this that leave such a concept so ripe for exploration. Once the three are escorted to the exam site, Leorio and Karapika have a back-and-forth exposition dump that is cleverly built into an argument about what a true hunter should be. It's a fun way to show the strain of a still-developing friendship while also dishing out a bunch of facts that will be important down the road. Then they arrive at the exam's first phase, and a bunch of new characters are introduced. I will admit that the 2011 anime hurts Hisoka's introduction a bit by having him turn a guy's arms into flower petals, where in the manga he presumably just chops them off. TV censorship, I get it. But this isn't how Hisoka's powers work. In theory, the significance of this moment is the same, but in practice, it just muddies the waters surrounding what he can and can't do. Then again, in the manga, there is no specific shot of him cutting them off, and I don't believe the arms even show up in the panel, so they just kind of disappear, so that doesn't really help either. But then again, the 99 anime doesn't do it much better. He's stuck in a wall or something? What? Why? How? Another noteworthy aspect of this episode is the introduction of another rookie named Nicholas. He gets enough build-up in the scene with Tanpa to seem like a potentially important contender, which makes his quick exit in the next episode all the more impactful. Various other characters characters had been tossing out numbers and percentages that emphasized just how rare it was for a rookie to make it to the Hunter exam, let alone pass it, yet we'll later see guys like Hanzo and Kilua join our three heroes as rookies who perform exceptionally in this exam. 
The trope of a main character being part of a talented class of prospects is not uncommon among battle shows like this, so it's nice to see someone suffer the consequences that unskilled newbies are supposedly meant to face in these scenarios. Not everyone needs to share the blessing of a protagonist's plot convenience. There's an interesting detail in the next scene that could easily be considered a flaw, but it plays into my theory of the anime's tonal misdirection, so I'll roll with it. The examiner's arrival is punctuated by this bouncy, goofy piece of music, which boldly contrasts the severity of his dialogue. This track downplays the potential consequences of the exam, as if these threats mean nothing to our protagonists. This is accompanied by several shots of the rookies looking confident before the camera finally settles on Gone. Then we pan across the crowd of applicants before again returning to Gone. Gone isn't afraid of what's to come, he's curious and excited. And because the visuals put so much emphasis on him, I get the impression that I'm viewing this discussion through his eyes. He's a kid, and a rookie. Of course he would initially overlook the dark undertones of the Hunter exam. Tonpa tried to poison him, and he thought it was an accident. This lightheartedness and the way it's challenged is a critical part of Gon's character throughout the series. But to effectively challenge it, you have to establish it first. The 99 anime somewhat stumbles in this regard by taking everything too seriously. But that's a discussion for another time. Now for the fun part. Episode 4 features nothing but the characters running down a long, dark tunnel. This section is often criticized for being slow, boring, and not offering much in the way of plot progression. And yes, the task is confined and monotonous, but it's supposed to be. Several applicants, including Leorio, assume that this phase must be a physical endurance test, but there's more to it than that. It's also a test of one's mental fortitude, their willpower, as no one has any knowledge of how far and for how long they'll be traveling. Some characters get by on their physical fitness alone, but for those who falter, like Leorio, it then comes down to whether or not they have enough resolve to push beyond their limits. This theme of confronting impossible odds and still attempting to overcome them pops up time and time again in Hunter x Hunter, and this tunnel run does an excellent job at laying the groundwork for that. The other purpose of this phase is to remove the overconfident slackers who don't belong there. A character like Nicholas enters the exam with the impression that he has all the answers, but he doesn't. To make light of the hunter exam is to make light of the dangers a hunter must face. Those who don't take things seriously might as well be throwing their life away. As my buddy Second Look puts it, the enclosed monotonous tunnel is an effective thematic transition that parallels the enclosed ideas of the world that these new challengers believe in. Those who can't escape that perspective will never escape this hallway. Nicholas puts too much faith in his calculations, and not enough faith in himself. When fatigue catches up to him, he doubts his ability to pass. This gives the Imahori brothers a chance to dig into those insecurities until they overwhelm Nicholas. His failure serves to contrast and emphasize Leorio's determination. He nearly gives up as well, but when he sees Gon looking back at him, he kicks his insecurities to the curb and plunges forward with renewed vigor. To top it off, you get this cute, innocent interaction between Gon and Killua. As for the lack of plot progression, I guess that's technically true, but there's so much going on in this episode that takes precedence over the plot. The next scene practically outlines Karapika's entire character arc, and Leorio reveals his backstory. But it's more than just exposition. This is the first moment where Leorio and Karapika finally let their guards down to one another. Leorio's selfish facade is cast aside, and the duo's developing connection is finally cemented. With Kilua's rise to prominence in this episode, the two pairs within the main four have taken shape. Several of the show's conceptual and technical strengths have been shown off, and the stage for the Hunter exam has been set. I won't act as if this was the greatest introduction to a series ever, but hopefully I've convinced you that the makings of a classic existed even in those first few episodes. 2017 was a stressful year but the overwhelming support this channel received helped me power through it all. I never expected I'd accomplish in three months what had previously taken me four and a half years, but you all made it happen, and I'm immensely grateful for that. I've got big ambitions for 2018, but with your continued support, I might be able to fulfill those ambitions. With that, I'd like to give a very special thank you to King Kevin 30 Micah Dunn, Stone Cold 007, India Charbonneau, and all of my other patrons for giving me an extra boost in my quest. I hope you all have had a fantastic 2017, and if you haven't, well then I hope that your 2018 is better. I hope that it's awesome, and until next time, keep on YouTubing.